Let's say we have the hypothesis that men tend to perceive their bodies more positively than women do. One way to test this is to do an experiment where men and women rate their own levels of attractiveness, but then you also have third-party people, strangers, also rate these same women and men in attractiveness. And so your actual measure will be the difference in how attractive people see themselves versus how attractive other people see them. And to plot this out, you could put down a scale from plus five to negative five, if each of these attractiveness rating is rated on a five point scale, where what you're doing is you're subtracting other people's ratings from your self rating. So in other words, let's say that you gave yourself a five, but everyone else gave you a one, then you're going to have a positive number or a positive self rating. But if you rated yourself really low, like a one and everyone else rated you a five, then you'd end up with a negative number or a negative self rating. Now let's say we ran the data and we found that women on the whole were pretty accurate in how they viewed themselves. Maybe they viewed themselves a little bit more negatively than other people did. But men on the other hand viewed themselves quite a bit more positively than other people did. And this is actually based on real data. This is what men and women typically do. Women rate themselves a little more negatively than they probably should or based on other people's ratings. Whereas men tend to rate themselves a little better compared to other people's ratings. But again, the big important question here is, is this difference real? Is this group difference more than you can expect from just chance findings alone? Well, this is again where significance testing comes in. Like the t-test, there are lots of different statistics that can calculate how likely is it that this difference or effect could be found by random chance alone. And all these tests produce what's called a p-score or a probability value. And the p-value is basically what's the probability that any effect you find is just due to luck. In other words, that the effect is not real. And typically in science, we want our p-values to be very low. So if a p-value is at a 0.1 or 10%, that means there's a 10% likelihood that this effect is not real, that it's just due to chance. Whereas if the p-value is 0.01 or 1%, that means there's just a 1% likelihood that this effect is due to chance. In other words, that's a 99% chance that the effect is real, that it's not just due to chance. And why are we so worried about this idea that our effect could be due just to luck or just to chance? Well, that's because in any experiment you run, a lot of times luck or chance can kind of mess with your data. So for example, let's say that when we collected men and women, we just happened to collect women with abnormally low self-esteem, or perhaps we collected men with abnormally high self-esteem. In other words, we had sampling error, or we didn't do a good job getting a sample that represented the population. There's always some chance that this kind of thing could happen. Or for example, let's say we use some procedure, some part of our experiment that caused women to underestimate their attractiveness or made men overestimate their attractiveness. This could be a confound. So perhaps it was the way we worded it. It could be that when we ask people how attractive they think they are, that women underestimate their own attractiveness because they're trying to appear humble. They're saying, oh, I'm not that attractive, when in fact, maybe inside, they know that they're attractive. Whereas men might not have this issue of trying to appear humble, and so maybe just are more honest in their self-attractiveness ratings. So whatever the case, whether it's due to sampling error, confounds, or anything else, we want to rule out that this could be the cause of our effects. And our usual cutoff for this is if we get a p-value that's at or below 0.05 or 5%. We use this across all the sciences, whether we're talking about psychology, chemistry, biology. Basically, we say if p is at or less than 5%, that that means there's only a 5% chance that any effect we found is just due to chance or just due to luck. And if that's true, then that means there's a 95% chance that this is a real effect that the experimental findings reflect something that's real in the population. So if we get a P that's equal or less than 0.05, then we're willing to conclude as scientists that this effect is likely real. And that's why we always use the term with 95% confidence. We could say with 95% confidence, we think that men overestimate their own attractiveness compared to women. And as scientists, we can never say that we know that an effect is true with 100% confidence, because we can always be wrong. But this is a way to figure out what are the things that we're highly confident about, 95% or more. One way we can quickly visualize whether there's a significant difference between two groups or not is through error bars. This is something you'll often see in journal articles. 
So they'll show the two means of the groups, plus there'll be these sort of eye looking annotations around it that show what's our best guess as to the mean of these groups within the larger population. And as a general rule, if the error bars do not overlap, so in this case, the top part of the error bar for women is still below the bottom part of the error bar for men, then we say there's likely a significant difference between these two groups. Whereas if there is overlap, so the error bars are overlapping in some way, then we say there probably isn't a significant difference. Or at least we can't say with 95% confidence that there's a significant difference between the two groups. And the reason this works is that error bars are basically our best guess as to where the means of these groups are in the actual population. They're also based on some statistics that use the 95% confidence rule. So basically, if we're 95% sure that the real mean of women and the real mean of men in the populations don't overlap, then we're 95% confident that there's a significant difference between these two groups. So to break this down a little bit, what this would mean is that in the experiment, women received a mean of let's say negative 0.5. We can run some statistics to figure out what this could mean for the population mean for women. So we could say with 95% confidence, we're pretty sure women's means are somewhere between a negative 1.5 and a zero. Whereas for men in our experiment, we found that the male average was around a 1.5. But again, running some statistics, we could say, well, there's a 95% chance the actual population mean for men could be somewhere between, let's say, a 0.5 and a 2.5. And again, if these 95% guesses of where the actual population means still don't overlap, that means that there's a very good chance that the two means in the population don't overlap either. In other words, this is a real group difference. So I know that can be a bit confusing, but the basic rule of thumb is that if there's no overlap between the error bars, then there is a significant difference. But if there is overlap between the error bars, then there's no significant difference. So it makes for a really easy way to visualize whether or not there's a significant difference between groups. So as an overview, when it comes to hypothesis testing, the first step is to form a hypothesis or a testable, falsifiable prediction. So you have a theoretical view of the world and then you create an experiment where you can test out that theory and either it'll be proven true or false. And then you actually go out and collect the data. You run the experiment. And then you conduct what's called significance testing. And the significance testing is always going to yield a p-value. Once again, if p is at or below a 0.05, then there's a 5% chance or less that this effect is just due to chance findings or just due to random variation in the data. In other words, there's a 95% likelihood or more that this is a real effect. So that's when we call the effect significant. We say, hey, this is probably a real effect that you find in the real world. But if p is greater than 0.05, then that's just too likely that the effect could be due to chance. And so we usually call that a non-significant effect. It could be a real effect in the real world, but we just don't have good enough evidence that it is to call it a real or significant effect yet. So throughout the class, we'll really be paying attention to whether significance values pass that 0.05 threshold. If it's below 0.05 or at 0.05, we say the effect is significant. But if it's above 0.05, we say it's non-significant. 